You can have fruit or cereal. It's cute and funny when little kids throw fits. It's not so cute and funny when you throw fits. National Institute of Health survey of 34,000 adults revealed that 7.8% of the population experience inappropriate, intense, or poorly controlled anger. Specifically, Anger triggered by small things or anger that was difficult to control, frequent temper outbursts or anger that lead to loss of control, hitting people or throwing objects in anger. Almost 10% of Americans lose their temper to the point that they lose control. We live in an angry, offended society. In this last year, the pressure of the pandemic and politics pushed people to the breaking point. Usually rational people became violently angry. Families were divided. Friendships were lost. Cable news networks add to the fury. Instead of pretending to actually report the news, they fill the airwaves with angry yelling rants. Some people sit and listen to that all day. Not only do they blindly accept that as truth, the rage affects them. If you fill your home with the sounds of anger, it's inevitable you'll become angry. We've actually banned those stations in our home because we don't want anger. We don't want to welcome anger in our house. Social media is the new battleground. I've watched people who I consider to be reasonable, gentle followers of Jesus turn into maniacal monsters on Facebook. And I've watched people I consider unreasonable go nuclear with their anger. People get angry and lose their temper at politicians, preachers, police, doctors, the media, clerks at Walmart, waiters, delivery drivers, their kids, their spouse, this week gas prices, the CDC, Our society has been reduced to anger, temper tantrums, broken relationships, and public fights. It's been incredibly sad to watch. I feel like it's time for a national day of kindness or maybe a national day of hugs or or for a law that for one day, everyone just has to be kind and say nice things. Yeah. You've experienced the, just the meanness. And it's not just society. The last 14 months have exposed the American church is immature, entitled, and nowhere near ready for persecution. Churches have been caught up in arguments over face masks, vaccines, racism, and politics. The list goes on and on. The pressure of 2020 reveal the immaturity and ugliness in people who claim to be God's children. Followers of Jesus fought and argued, not about eternal things, but earthly things. I've watched as disagreements have grown to the place where supposed followers of Jesus question the salvation of anyone who dared to disagree with their position. The church in America wasted one of its greatest opportunities in the last hundred years to give hope and to share Jesus. Instead, the church added to the storm. More people heard about our political perspective and medical opinions than about the God we claim to love and serve. COVID didn't divide the church. The church divided itself. We have sacrificed the message of the cross and replace it with heated opinions, angry outbursts, and temper tantrums that rival that of a preschooler who's lost their toy. 
Shame on the church and shame on us. In his book, When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box, John Ortberg wrote, a man is being tailgated by a woman who's in a hurry. He comes to an intersection, and when the light hits yellow, he hits the brakes. The woman behind him goes ballistic. She honks her horn at him. She yells her frustration in no uncertain terms. She rants and she gestures. While she's in mid-rant, someone taps on her window. She looks up and sees a policeman. He invites her out of the car and takes her to the station where she's searched and fingerprinted and put in a cell. After a couple of hours, she's released and the arresting officer gives her a personal effect saying, I'm very sorry for the mistake, ma'am. I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, using bad gestures and bad language. I noticed the what would Jesus do bumper sticker, the choose life license plate holder, the follow me to Sunday school window sign, the Christian fish emblem on your trunk, and I naturally assumed you had stolen the car. <laughs> he goes on to say, the world gets pretty tired of people who have Christian bumper stickers on their cars, Christian fish signs on their trunks, Christian books on their shelves, Christian stations on their radio, Christian jewelry around their necks, Christian videos for their kids, and Christian magazines for their coffee tables, but don't actually have the life of Jesus in their bones or the love of Jesus in their hearts. There are many warnings in the Bible about anger and losing your temper. Psalm 37, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed. Those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. James 1, 9 in King James Version says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. In the NIV it says, dear brothers and sisters, take note of this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Ecclesiastes 7, 9, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Maybe as I read those verses, you're thinking about the last time you lost your temper. Many of you don't have to go back very far. Maybe it was on the drive this morning. Not only did you violate scriptural commands, you also damaged your testimony and made yourself look foolish. And now you wonder, can I come back from this? When you lose your temper at church and make a fool of yourself, you wonder, will people ever respect me again? Will the pastors ever think the same way of me? How about God? Does he have a plan and purpose for me or am I just damaged goods? Today we look at one of the most famous men in the Bible. God used him in remarkable ways and did incredible miracles through him. But before that happened, he had a horrible temper-filled moment that almost destroyed him. Let me set the scene for you. There was a new Pharaoh in Egypt. The Israelites were captives and slaves, but their number was growing dramatically. Pharaoh was concerned the Israelites would turn against them in a war, so he hatched a plan to reduce their number. Pharaoh instructed the midwives who helped the Hebrew women give birth to kill every boy. If the baby's a girl, let it live. If it's a boy, then and there, kill it. That way the Hebrew people will have no future generations. But the midwives were trained to deliver babies, not kill babies. They ignored the order and they let all the babies live. Pharaoh grew more concerned, something had to be done. We pick it up at Exodus chapter one, verse 22. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, every boy that's born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Since the midwives wouldn't do it, Pharaoh empowered the people, telling them, if you see a Hebrew baby boy, throw him in the river. If the baby didn't drown, he would quickly be eaten by crocodiles. Can you imagine the panic? Only an incredibly evil ruler would allow babies to be thrown into the river. Now, a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. 
She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Ordinarily, that'd be good news. But in this case, having a son was bad news because as soon as he was discovered, he'd be killed. When she saw he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile in a desperate attempt to save her boy. The baby's mother made a waterproof basket and put him in the water along the banks of the Nile River. River. Now remember, that's the same place Pharaoh ordered the people to throw the baby boys. This was not the Arkansas River. The Nile River wasn't a safe place to put a baby. There were crocodiles and wild animals. We read that story, it doesn't really describe the emotion. I remember when Cindy and I left Tyler, now Pastor Tyler, at college. I pretty much held it together until we left. And when we drove off that campus, I started crying so hard I couldn't see to drive. That was my son I was leaving behind. I wasn't leaving Tyler forever. I'd see him in four weeks. Tyler wasn't floating down a crocodile-infested river in a basket. He was going to Bible college. (laughs) This mom put her three-month-old son in the basket and walked to the river. And you can imagine the scene, her weeping uncontrollably as she knelt down and she placed that basket in the edge of the water and saw her baby begin to float away. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. Remember, it was her father who gave the order to kill Hebrew baby boys. Pharaoh's daughter was supposed to obey her dad, take the baby out of the basket, and throw it in the water. The whole time the baby's sister was watching, when Pharaoh's daughter found the baby, the sister ran up to her, and the the sister said, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Go, she answered. And, And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me. I'll pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Only God. Mom took her baby to the river and said her final goodbye. Now she's being paid to care for her own baby. And you're saying, I want to sign up for that deal. (laughs) God returned the child to her as only God can do. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Moses moved out of his mother's house and into Pharaoh's palace. Moses didn't have to worry about being killed. Instead, he was loved as grandson of the Pharaoh. The historian Josephus tells us that because the Pharaoh had no son or heir, Moses was raised to one day assume the throne. He would be the next Pharaoh. While other Hebrews were captive slaves, Moses had a life of privilege, wealth, and power. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. Moses had heard about the slave labor. He'd heard about the cruelty of the Egyptians. One day, he decided to see for himself what was being done for his people. And while he was there, He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. The word used here for beating speaks of a violent attack, the kind of beating that would result in death. The cruelty was so great that Moses couldn't just stand back and watch. His resentment turned to anger, and in a fit of temper, his anger became action. The injustice was real. Something needed to be done. But remember, 
Moses was grandson to the Pharaoh and the future leader of Egypt. He had position, he had influence, he had wealth, he had power. Moses could have shouted a command and the beating would have stopped. He could have snapped his fingers and summoned a soldier and had the Egyptian arrested. But in that moment of temper, punishing the Egyptian wasn't enough for Moses. Glancing this way and that, seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses interrupted the beating with a beating of his own. In a fit of rage, he viciously beat the Egyptian to death. That cruel Egyptian deserved to be punished. What he did was wrong. But Moses lost his temper and committed murder. Realizing what he'd done, Moses tried to hide his sin by burying the body in the sand. The next day, Moses went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The same word was used here as was used when the Egyptian was being the Hebrew. It was a violent fight. Someone was going to be killed. So Moses intervened and said, you guys can't do this. Why, Hebrews fighting Hebrews, stop. And the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me like you killed that Egyptian? Moses' sin prevented him from addressing the sin of others. When he took things into his own hands, he lost his influence and the right to lead. When you act on your temper, you don't just lose your temper, you also lose your influence. See, there are two schools of thoughts. One says, I have the credibility to address this because I've personally gone through it. I've made those same mistakes. The other way of thinking says, I have the credibility to address this because I stuck to God's plan. I didn't fall into that trap. So I'll let you decide who would you get advice from? Where would you go for marriage advice? Someone whose marriage failed or someone who's been married 50 years and they still love each other? Who would you rather go to for financial advice? Someone who's declared bankruptcy several times and is currently broke or someone who has a successful business? Who do you want to get retirement advice from? Someone who says, boy, I messed up and I wasn't ready, so I'll help you. Or someone says, I figured it out and did it right. Who would you listen to when they corrected you about fighting? The guy who killed an Egyptian in anger? Or the person who was able to control their temper? Moses lost his influence when he decided to take things into his own hands and follow his own plan. Then Moses was afraid and he thought, what I did must have become known. See, Moses thought no one seen him and that he'd covered his tracks. He murdered the bad guy, he hid the body, and he got away with it. But someone saw and someone told. And now people were talking about the murder, and guess what? The story made it all the way to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. From heir to the throne and favorite grandson to common criminal, Moses lost his temper and it cost him everything. It cost him his home, his adopted family, his position in the kingdom, his future, all of it. But Moses' sin didn't stop God's plan for his life. It did put it on hold for 40 years. Instead, anoint, Moses was anointed to lead the Israelites out of captivity, but instead of leading his people, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness taking care of sheep. Because of Moses' sin, because he took things in his own hands, God's plan for his life was delayed. If the story ended there, Hopefully, you'd be convinced not to lose your temper. 
You'd vow never to take things in your own hands, but instead to trust God's plan. You would see the cost of irrational anger. You'd be warned. Hopefully, you'd avoid the same mistake. But this series is about comebacks. And I want to show you the rest of the story. If you've lost your temper, if you took matters into your own hands, if you've made a fool of yourself and missed God's plan, stay tuned because God still has a plan for you. Fast forward about 40 years. Moses is now around 80 years old. He was married. He had two kids, which if, if you're 80 and you got two kids, you're just tired. <laughs> I mean, come on now. It's, you have your grandkids over and you have them for about two days and you can barely move. <laughs> Moses at 80, he had, he's got kids in the house. He's making a living as a shepherd, a hard, difficult job. He's made a, a new comfortable life for himself, but he wasn't with his people. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do, and he hadn't seen his family in years. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of the Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert, and he came to Oreb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. When the Lord saw he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now you go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses' heart dropped when he heard he was supposed to go to Egypt, back to the place of his greatest failure, back to the place where he didn't want belong, back to the place he had left in shame. When you're asked to revisit the place of your greatest failure, it can be easy to run away from it and instead just stay in your new place of comfort. If you lost your temper and made a fool of yourself at church, it can be easy to just stay away from church because you don't want to face the guilt and the shame of what you did. But God had a plan. God had a plan to redeem Moses, to redeem his people's suffering, and to rescue them both. God said to Moses, you go, and as you go, I'll be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When, when you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses, you're coming back to this place with the people. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say, what's his name? What should I tell him? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. What a remarkable comeback. The guy who short-circuited God's plan because of his temper had a life-changing encounter with God and was sent back to Egypt to lead his people free. Moses' temper, 
And his temper-filled moment of rage cost him influence, position, wealth, and power. It delayed God's plan for his life, but it didn't stop God's plan for his life. Now I want to fast forward one more time. This time to Exodus chapter 34. Following God's plan, relying on God's power, Moses successfully led the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt. I am condensing a long time of history there into two sentences. It's an epic, incredible story. Moses went up on Mount Sinai, and once again, Moses had a face-to-face encounter with God. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, With the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he'd spoken with the Lord. Talk about a comeback. Moses was invited to the top of the mountain where he had a dramatic encounter with God, and it was obvious to everyone that Moses had been in the presence of the Lord because his face was glowing from God's presence. Now back to the start of my message. The church in America has lost influence, position, and so much more because of irrational anger. Some of you have diminished your testimony because of your temper. Others of you have ranted with anger at the very people you've been praying would come to Jesus. It's embarrassing. And it's shameful. I thought about giving you five ways to control your anger. That'd be good. I think I could do that pretty well because I, I really, I don't have much of a temper. I think I could speak from somewhat of a position of authority on that. Or I thought about giving you 10 steps to recover after you've lost your temper. I think I could do that pretty well. You know, pretty good, just step one, step two, step three, do this if you've lost your temper. There's certainly some things you need to do to make it right with those who've been the object of your rational behavior. You need to go back and apologize. You need to fix some things. We could talk through that. And I think at some point, I'll teach that. We'll do that. But today, I just want to stop and give you the first and most important step in your comeback. If you've lost your temper, if you've lost your influence, do like Moses and get in the presence of God. And in his presence, you can be fully restored. If you'll spend enough time in God's presence, your character will change. God's nature will affect your nature and something will change inside you that will show up on the outside of you. When God does a work in your heart, it becomes evident to people around you. Your face may not glow, although that would be really, really cool. I would love that. But your life will radiate with the glory of God. When you sense anger rising up of you, in you, instead of running to fight or share your opinion, run to the presence of the Lord. God still has a plan and purpose for you, and you discover his purpose and his plan in his presence. There is nothing like the presence of the Lord. And I think the answer to all the confusion and frustration and anger and opinions in the church is we need to get back to God's presence. We need to get in his presence and allow him to change us. And that's what we're going to do today. It's early. I don't want you to leave. I understand some people are uncomfortable in the presence of the Lord. I understand that. If, but we're going to spend some time now just in his presence. No rules. You can stand. You can sit. Uh, you can kneel. You know, my preference is I like to kneel at the front. I'm going to do that, but you can do whatever you want. I, it's fine with me. But we're just going to spend time in his presence. You can sing or you cannot sing. We're going to spend time in his presence, and we're going to allow him to change us. Lord, we welcome and invite 
your presence in this place. And we are open to the possibility that there are some things in us, in our reactions to others, in our nature, in our personality, in our temper that need to be adjusted by you. As we spend time in your presence, would you change us, we pray. In the name of Jesus.